We're going to work on something a little different this time. This is a bare chassis out of an arcade game. It's an RGB monitor. I have no way of actually driving this monitor, but I'm going to do a cap kit for it. Replace all the caps on the chassis and we'll see if it fires up. Apparently it doesn't have a very good picture, so hopefully this is going to improve things a bit. I'm sure it will. Uh, it's about a dozen or so caps to change, so let's get started. In this episode, I'm going to work on, this is a chassis from a video console, video game, and CRT. It's an RGB CRT. The RGB inputs down here. This is the power inputs. I don't have any source of an RGB signal to send this. This would be probably a CGA output. It's not, I don't believe it's VGA. I think it's just straight CGA. But what we're going to do on this, I've got a capacitor kit. We're going to change out the caps on the board and uh, I'll have to just send it back to the, the client like that and he'll have to do his final adjustments once he gets it back into his cabinet. But to do that, I'm going to remove the chassis from the actual circuit board. Great. Shielding is already falling off this. Uh, we're going to remove the chassis from the, the board itself and uh, disconnect the at second anode and uh, then I can work on the chassis away from the actual picture tube. Everything will just plug in here. There'll be a yoke plug, a uh, degaussing plug, and the, of course the tube socket which we can unplug from the back here. That way I can work on the chassis separate without uh, having to worry about um, the CRT being in the way and getting damaged and stuff. See that they've glued on the, um, the connector here to take the, the silicone off of the the uh, tube here so I can disconnect it. Unplug the tube socket and I'll disconnect the yoke plug and the ground strap and the degaussing plug is right here. Yoke plug is down here. Disconnect that. Disconnect the high voltage lead. Make sure it's grounded first. Make sure that there's no high voltage charge built up. This shouldn't be because this has been unplugged for quite a period of time, but it never hurts to make sure it's fully discharged. We do that by just putting a ground lead in and touching the button. Make sure that there's no high voltage on there, and then we can just remove the high voltage cap. fun to get these open especially cat wants to play cat can hear me working away in here and he wants to come in and play <laughs> unplug the yoke I've done that already Okay, now I should be able to separate the uh, chassis. I've got one ground wire that's still connected here. I'll just have to unsolder the ground wire so that the CRT ground is separate. Then I can remove the chassis to work on it. I think the quarter inch. Now the chassis will just lift straight out once I've disconnected the wires. And I can put this away for safekeeping and work on the chassis by itself. So here I have the, the kit of all the capacitors to replace on this one. And I got all the parts here. Uh, pretty straightforward. We're going to change out all the electrolytic caps. 
This actually belongs to the, the same guy that had the green TV with the transparent case. So this is another one from his collection from his arcade game. So let's get started and change out the cap. So as I say, I won't be able to test it because I don't have any way to power it up. But it should be fine. And worst case scenario, he's going to have to adjust the focus on the screen control once it's back in service. I'll start out with the small caps first. So we'll start out with the one microfarad 50 volts. There are two of them on the board here. This would be for uh, C315 and, th and C351. They are, there's C315 and 351 are these two right down here, these two here. So we'll start out with uh, this one here. C315. We'll just remove it. That's 315 out. New and install install the new one. Third one's right here. It goes across D306, which is right in the middle of the board here. There's a capacitor strung across it, and we'll just cut the old one out and stick the new one on top. like the original one was. Okay, that one's done. So that's the one mic replaced. Let's get on to the next ones. Next we'll change out the 2.2 value. The C308 is one of the ones down here. got a, a diode going to one side of it. We'll just remove that temporarily. Small little red cap. You know what they say about red caps, eh? they're usually special. Usually it means they're special low ESR or they're a special frequency rating, and that's why they differentiate them by making them a different color. Anyway, Nothing looks that special about that one. It's only 85 degree. We're putting in a 105. I think this is a 105. Yeah, we're putting a 105 in, in place of it. And of course, replacing the diode that was on there. Okay. 
dad was connected to the was it positive side or was it the negative? This side anyway. C308, which is also a 2.2, but this one was missing from the kit. 2.2 at one uh, at 50, which I just so happened that I've got one, so we'll put mine in because it was missing. So 308 is um, it's more over on the other side, I believe. This is one, or is that the one I just changed? That was 303, uh, or was that 308? That was 308. I changed. Sorry, 303 is over here. And more in the middle of the board. Right down there. So let's get that one out. Replace that one. You notice that I use the wick just very sparingly just to usually just to clear off the holes if they don't open up when I remove the component just to make it a little easier to install the new one. Yeah, that's those two done. Next we'll do the, there's um, a 4.7 at 160, but there's a, a, a note on here that's either going to be a 4.7 or a 10, depending on what's in there now, because the chassis is different. So let's find C311 and see what's in there already. So C311 is behind this heat sink down here. What's already in there? Let's see what we've already got. We'll replace it with whatever the value the original one was. It's to be this one that's glued in place. There's a bunch of circuit glue that they pour in here to stop parts from bouncing around, I guess, in shipment or so forth. But it's this one here. And this one here is originally a 4.7 at 160. So that's what we'll replace it with, a 4.7 at 160 volts. Take a look at the size difference between the old and the new. So they're both Nikicon caps. Uh, this is the 4.7 at 160, 85 degree, and this is the 4.7, 160, 105 degrees. Wow, what a difference between the old and the new. Always pay attention to your polarity too. The board will be marked, but always try to. Uh, Make a note when you take them out because sometimes the board markings are wrong. So far I haven't found any on this, but that has been known to happen where the silk screening has been incorrect. So it's always a good idea to make a note when you remove something to what way it came out. Verify that the way that it was installed is the way that it was marked on the board. Because had it been put in backwards at the factory, it wouldn't have lasted this long. But if you just replace them with what is printed on the board and it's, the silk screening is wrong, uh, you'll be in for a smoky experience very quickly. I hear the door creaking. Maybe a cat's going to come to visit me. This is a 10 microfarad. It's uh, C310. It's back here. And there's another one. C702 is... Uh, Somewhere in here, I'll find it in a minute, but 310 is this one here. It's easy to see. It's easy to get at. Right there.
actually get something accomplished today other than like yesterday I spent well besides cutting together the, the video of my fiber installation uh, I spent half the day working on a, that JVC VCR which I have made very little progress on and only to discover that when it plays it does a very bad picture on playback too it's full of dropouts and the auto head cleaner cycles regularly on it like it's detecting the signal is low so I think may, that may have worn heads to boot with the fact that it doesn't rewind but uh, I've been shooting video on it I won't talk about it in this one as to what I speculate it might be you'll have to wait till I put the video up when I get around to doing that uh, it's certainly not done yet but I've got some ideas what it might be um, and I found some things in there that uh, I didn't expect like oil underneath one of the reel tables that uh, was not expected and that was causing slipping and that may have been actually why the idler was slipping in the first place was because the uh, the edge of the plastic hub was coated in oil but uh, so obviously somebody's been into that machine I always just love getting things sent to me that people have been into I'm sure that that machine probably was a, could have been an eBay purchase or something but uh, it's uh, certainly not going to be an easy one to uh, resolve. C702 is uh, on this one here. It should be in here somewhere. Yeah, it looks like it's right in next to the linearity coil. And that is it right down there, I'm sure. And it should be right in here somewhere. There it is, right there. C702 is there. This one, maybe I'll use some solder wick on this one just to undo the pins in advance just to make it a little easier to get this one out because it's a hard one to reach. I'll be pulling this one out with pliers I think. But there's times when you just get these nice easy here just recap my amplifier or recap my monitor easy peasy work right this is uh, about as simple as it gets because you're not really doing any troubleshooting you're just replacing parts and as they say anybody can replace parts easiest job there is especially when you've got a sheet which shows you where all the parts are and gives you all the values it doesn't get any easier than this I wish all my work was this simple here just recap my amp here's the kit sure this is something a lot of people will do themselves is they'll, they'll redo all the caps in it because well if you're changing out caps if, if you've got bad caps you've got caps that are getting a bit weak changing them out is going to fix your problem and uh, there's not really any troubleshooting required whereas when you've got a, a fault with a unit it's a little more involved because you're you're chasing down an individual part in this case we're assuming that all the semis and everything are good and we're just changing out all the caps so it's a a pretty straightforward relaxing job that can be done you know I mean I could if I was in a rush I could probably have this thing done in half an hour I'm kind of taking my time on it today there's not that many parts to change I will be giving it a once over and looking for any other uh, faults that might uh, be cropping up that I've already noticed like maybe I'll take care of this right now while I've well, I'm thinking about it. It looks like the connections here are a bit cracked if we look down here. See? Around here. That looks like a, a fault waiting to happen. We'll go back to the drive transformer back here as well. Take a look at those. I'll just redo those connections while I've got the board upside down here because just looking at it, it looks like, especially the one on the collector, is um, a little bit uh, questionable here. Of course, this is not even the transistor that was designed to go on the board. This is designed for a plastic transistor, and they've got a metal TO3 that's been mounted on a separate heat sink. So there's just this is either going to a socket or it's to wires that just go up to the board. I think it's just to wires that go up to the uh, the board itself. Back to the drive transformer is back here. Look at this one up here. Looks like that one's ready to crack. Uh, solder connections failing on the horizontal drive transformer is the number one cause of output transistor failure. 
because you lose drive and when you lose if you when you lose drive if it happens when that transistor is in the on state it'll blow the transistor as a rule well it will blow the transistor um, how the horizontal circuit operates is it's a very very quick pulse so it, the transistor comes on and it's only on for a, a split second and what and what it ends up doing is it produces a, a waveform that looks like this that's your pulse but that's what energizes your flyback transformer and uh, causes your horizontal retrace but if the transistor if the connection to the base and the, the signal that's driving this typically a, a square wave like this but if the signal that's driving this transistor um, goes bad and the transistor stays in the on position too long uh, well, usually if it starts to crack, you'll end up with a, a very bad signal that kind of kind of looks like this. It's ringing all over the place, right? Because it, the, the connection is arcing. And that can blow the transistor and short it. So whenever you work on uh, CRT equipment, it's always a good idea to check the uh, connections on the horizontal drive transformer, which is this guy right down here, and, of course, the output transistor for bad solder because it will blow things up. Next we have a 22 at 160, it should be C506, which is this one down over here, underneath the regulator. And that is exactly what it is, it's a regulator uh, filter. Again, look at the size difference from an Elna 22 microfarad 160 to the new Nikicon. Much, you know, I mean, this feels like it's very light, feels like it's dried out. Next two are C352 and 354. They're both the same. They're 47 at, at 50, so we'll, we'll pop them out. 352 and 354. Uh, there's they're right down here, 351, 352, and uh, where's 354? It should be right next to it. 352, 351, 352, and... 352 and 354. I see them. There's 352 and there's 354. Okay, yeah, they're, they're, they're down here. There it is. 352 and 354. 351 is up here. Yeah, I already changed that one, so 350. 2 and 354, right there.
Next are these two big ones, C507 and C313. Uh, did I say? Yeah, 313 and 507. They are uh, 47 at 250 volts. So we'll remove those at the same time. See this one right there. Or it's getting hard to read because it's been worked on before, so. So that's one there, and the other one is 313. Two more caps that have been glued in on the top too. There's one, and the other one is this one down here. Two giant caps that are being replaced by much smaller one's a bigger one so 313 on this case is uh, 100 microfarad and this one's a 47 giving a shout out to Kai Wheats who sent me these nice little wire cutters to try out. Little nippers work pretty good. Figured I'd use them on something. Might as well use them on this one. Next is C301 which is a what is it? 330 I think? Yeah, 330 at 50 volts C301 down here. Right next to a tantalum that someone's put on the bottom of the board. You know what we call tantalums, right? We call them firecrackers. Because when they blow, they usually explode. Here's that one. They've actually got two tantalums in parallel. It doesn't look like those ones are on the list on the kit, so I guess they don't need to be replaced. It was probably a factory mod. Or they came from the factory with a tantalum in there.
We're down to the last three. C205. It's a 47 at 200 or 470 at 25 volts. C205 right here right in the middle of the board. One thing I'll note is that the cap kit is not changing every single cap, like the large filter. The top of the screen there is not being changed. There's many that didn't get changed. There were just key caps in the horizontal and the vertical deflection and the screen power supply are the ones that were changed. But not all of them. Typically the most common ones to cause a problem is what they're changing with this cap kit. The last two caps, C201 and C701. So C201 is right in the middle here. It's a big one. How's the microfarad at uh, 25 volts, I believe? And then I'll pop the chassis back in and we'll power it up. Although I won't be able to say I won't be able to put a signal through it because uh, I don't have any means to generate a signal. This being a it'd be a CGA but I don't have any computers or any generators now. Someone's going to say, why don't you have a generator? You should have a generator. I can just see the comments now. Someone's like, why don't you have a generator? Well, because I'm not in the business. That's why. If I was doing this every day full time and doing this for a living, I guess I'd have a generator, but I'm not. So, um, I can't see the uh, use and ex the expense of buying a, a generator for something that I'll never use or only use once got bit by that when I was in the business. Told this story many times with Panasonic or Technique about Panasonic. They uh, insisted that we purchase a special jig for aligning CD players. It was like a really expensive piece of equipment. I think it was like seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars. It was the boss just about had a stroke. Maybe that's why he had a stroke. I bought this ridiculously expensive piece of equipment that we were told that we had to have and it got used exactly once. Paid us 50 bucks for the repair on a $1,700 investment. Uh, 701 is um, hiding down here. This is the other one down here, the last one. And uh, there it is, right there. So once we get this one changed, I can then pop the chassis back in the cabinet. We'll power it up and see if it lights up. If it lights up, that's the best I can do on this. It's been sitting in here for a few weeks to get to because I've been busy with other things. So I'm just trying to clear out. I got so much stuff that's come in that's sitting here waiting to be repaired. You guys have no idea. For someone who's not in the repair business, for someone who retired from the repair, repair business 20 years ago, I'm staying busy. I guess I'll, I'll come out of retirement when I retire from the phone company in a couple of years. I got two more years to go there. And then I'll, I'll come out of the repair business and maybe start taking on even more repairs if I, if I feel like it. All right, that's all the caps replaced on this monitor. I'm gonna go and grab the rest of the chassis and we'll reinstall the, the circuit board, reconnect all the plugs and fire it up and see what it does.
plug in the yoke plug. And the degaussing coil plugs in over here. The DAG ground, as they call it. Reconnect that down to the front of the little board here. It goes on to the CRT. That's the ground wire that grounds the edge of the CRT. Grounds the what they call the aqua DAG, which is the the um, carbon coating on the back side of the tube here. That's the ground. If you don't ground that, you usually end up with a bunch of arcing and sparking. <laughs> As the, as the tube will act like a giant capacitor and charge up the outside of the tube. Plug the CRT plug back in. And of course, last but not least, the Cobra, as we called it. We used to call this thing the Cobra because, you know, it kind of looks like a Cobra. It bites. Dust off the inside of this. We don't need any unnecessary dust here to create a place for air to ionize and jump out and bite you. clips back in like that onto the tube. Now normally you would discharge the tube before doing this but I've I already checked the tube to make sure there's no charge on it and it's not going to build up a charge because it's been unplugged for quite a long period of time otherwise you wouldn't want to be sticking your fingers in there like that. You'd want to have a, a ground strap to ground it up but it hasn't been powered up for a while and it's completely discharged. Okay, the unit is now ready to power up. I've got the power cord here. I can just hook this up to my, my test leads and plug this into power and this thing should fire up and produce a raster. And that's about all we can hope for is we see a raster because this is a no way to drive it. All right, I'm gonna power this up through the dim bulb tester. I've got the power off now. Turn on the dim bulb and see whether it's gonna start. My dim bulb is glowing bright, like it's drawing more current then the bulb itself is capable of, there we go, it looks like it started up now. I can, I can hear something going on. We'll fire it up without the dim bulb on now. I can feel high voltage, so I know that something's fired up. But again, I probably won't see anything on the screen without giving it drive. So I have to assume that it's working. I can, I can feel the high voltage, so I know that the, the horizontal is running. I wonder if I kill the lights, whether we'll see it glowing. Oh, you know what? I can see it. I can see light. Okay, let's just kill some of the lights in here. We do have a raster. I can see it. You see it? Shut down all the lights. Now you guys can see it. It's working. And when I shut off the power, of course. So, I would have to say, success. If, I, if only I had something to drive it with, then we'd be able to see a picture, but... Another CRT monitor repaired. I don't know how tired this tube is because it's got probably got lots and lots of hours. There is some screen burn, but uh, it's been recapped. And I've got it running on full power now. I turned off the dim bulb. Once I, once I saw the power supply charge up and the, the current drop down, the bulb lit up fairly bright initially once the caps charged up. Then I heard the high voltage come on and the bulb went down very dim. So I shut the dim bulb off. And there we go. Monitor is working. So thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.